Mahma of religion. The second panel, the second panel on high-tech repression of people of faith in China. So without taking much time, I'm happy to uh, introduce our moderator, Mr. Kama Chuying, the Secretary for Department of Information and International Relations, Central Tibetan Administration. So, Kung uh, Kamala, can you start? And the state is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now it's uh, time for the second panel discussion. Uh, China is uh, one of the worst violators of freedom of religion and belief says uh, the European Parliament's Intergroup on Freedom of Religion and Bl uh, or Belief and Religious Tolerance Annual Report 2017. China's record has never been any good in the past. In fact, in the past, the conventional methods of repressing and violating religious belief and religious freedom, and now with the use of various high-end technologies, China has taken the violation of religious freedom and belief to a whole new level. And in fact, it, uh, it has been further propagating these new technologies to other repressive countries across the world. It is indeed a serious challenge, not only to the victims of direct Chinese repression, like the Tibetans, East Turkestan, the Southern Mongolia, Mongolians, but it is, it is indeed a serious concern for the rest of the world. So without further delay, I would like to welcome eminent panelists with me here today. And the topic for today's discussion or the panel is high-tech repression of people of faith in China. And without further delay, as I said, I would like to request uh, Pujung La, Pujung Ketering La to uh, proceed. And before that, I would like to introduce Mr. Pujung La for your information. Mr. Bujung Siring is the Vice President of International Campaign for Tibet in Washington, D.C. He is a former Central Tibetan administra Administration staff and has also worked, worked as a journalist at Indian Express, one of the leading newspapers in India. Newspapers in India. He's, he is a member of task force, task force established by the Tibetan leadership to work on issues regarding the dialogues with China. He was also a member of team led by envoys of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in discussions that they had with Chinese leadership between 2002 and 2010. He has also testified on behalf of ICT at the U.S. Congress. Please, Pujula. Good afternoon and uh, thank you all for joining in this afternoon's session. Uh, I'm no expert on high-tech uh, equipment or technology, so my uh, presentation will be an overview of what China's uh, use of high-tech uh, systems uh, impacts or how it impacts the Tibetan people. And I would like to touch the issue uh, in these uh, three uh, categories. First of all, I would like to lay out what is Tibetan religious identity. For us to understand what repression is, we need to understand what uh, Tibetan religious identity is. Secondly, how China has been adopting its policy on Tibetan religious identity that sort of uh, is transforming uh, Tibetan Buddhism into one, what China wants to uh, be known as uh, Chinese Tibetan Buddhism, if you will. Thirdly, and based on these, what can be done by the international community? First, uh, religion is very much at the heart of Tibetan identity. Uh, there are quite a few Tibetans over here that would know in the, in the early stage of Tibetan resistance to Chinese communist invasion of Tibet, 
There was a resistance group that was uh, set up, which you can screen, uh, whose logo you can see here on the screen. It's called uh, in Tibetan Tenso Thala Maga, which uh, it literally can be translated into English as volunteer, voluntary force for the defense of the faith. The Chinese invaded a nation, but the people's core concern, if you will, was on the defense of the faith. And that shows you the importance that the Tibetan people plays on our religious identity. And this religious identity, if you look at Tibetan Buddhism, first of all, is about a teacher-student relationship. It's not enough to have a fancy uh, monastery. It's not enough to see people going around monasteries. Tibetan Buddhism's core issue is about the transfer of philosophy from the teacher to the student. And uh, to do that, the teacher has to have the freedom to teach. The students have had the freedom to travel to receive these teachings. Uh, here you can see a photo of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama giving teachings in the Ramsala in October, where people from throughout the world uh, come every year uh, to listen to his teachings. This is what we are talking about when we talk about Tibetan religious freedom. Uh, secondly, uh, when we talk about uh, religious freedom. Again, uh, the practitioners, the Buddhist believers should have the freedom to go wherever they want, whoever they want to listen to and to, in whatever capacity they want to understand the teaching as in the case of the receiving the Kala Chakra from His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Bodh Gaya over here. <coughs> then this is also about uh, the transfer of Buddhist philosophy from the teacher to the students. Uh, in addition to empowerment and uh, initiations, uh, monks, novices should have the freedom to go and receive teachings from their teachers uh, and for the teachers to teach the student in the way they want them to be understood. All these have to be in the framework of a Tibetan Buddhist uh, governance system that is primarily, that is centrally, that is over, uh, completely run by Tibetan Buddhist practitioners and not by non-Buddhist communist uh, authority. Uh, in the screen, on the screen you'll see uh, at the website, this is a uh, recent times in the past we didn't have website but still we had the system of what is called uh, Lurchi. If you talk, uh, take the three big seats of Sera Drepong and Ganden, they all had the central governance structure that is elected by the monastic community themselves and which is in charge of overall monastic system. Uh, I'll come to the Chinese uh, way of doing things later. And then here again, uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, again, another facet is for the practitioners to be able to go on pilgrimages wherever they want, which sacred places they want, without any inhibition. The photo here is said to be from 1948. From those days, until 1959, or even into uh, uh, some part of uh, 1960s, 70s, Tibetans did have some uh, sort of ability to go wherever they want. Today, the situation is not like that. Now, what is China, what has China been trying to do? Overall, in the initial stages, China tried to destroy Tibetan religion. And that includes this physical destruction of monastic institutes, uh, destruction of the monastic system, including uh, making monks and nuns disrobe, uh, destroying monastic structure where uh, the recognition of Tibetan uh, tulku system was not allowed. All these was uh, meant to replace Tibetan Buddhism with communism. That policy unfortunately did not succeed uh, in the uh, 1980s when there was a brief policy of liberalization. Uh, Tibetans once again revived their spiritual uh, identity and we could see that even under the restrictive system inside Tibet, Tibetans once again started to revive Buddhism. Therefore, the Chinese realized that their policy was not working and they so altered their policy and now they changed their policy from destruction to control of Tibetan Buddhism. That's why uh, one very specific case is of the Penchen Lama who passed away in 18, 1989. 
His reincarnation was found in 1995. Uh, the Chinese authorities who previously banned uh, the recognition of reincarnation now began to embrace reincarnation but to use it for its own advantage and therefore the Chinese rejected His Holiness the Dalai Lama's recognition of the Panchen Lama and uh, instead placed its own selection, uh, Communist Party selected uh, boy, now man, as the Panchen Lama. And through this person the Chinese Communist system tried to uh, control Tibetan Buddhism. Also they tried to separate the Tibetan peoples, knowing that His Holiness the Dalai Lama was the core of Tibetan identity, knowing that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the symbol of Tibetan Buddhism, they tried to sort of uh, separate him from the Tibetan people. That includes banning the people from uh, having portraits of the Dalai Lama. And they tried to separate the Tibetan people from the Dalai Lama's teachings by not allowing Tibetan people who were able to go out from Tibet into the exiled communities in the 80s, in the 90s, and early part of 2000, uh, to, when they come back, not allow them to bring in his teachings, whether it's in the book or audio or video. And also, uh, simultaneously banning uh, Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, Voice of Tibet, All India Radio, those radio services that broadcast in Tibetan, these services were jammed so that the Tibetan people did not have an opportunity to listen to the Dalai Lama or other Buddhist uh, uh, teachers. Then uh, they also tried to use the uh, high-tech equipment like uh, screening uh, or controlling systems in the movement of people from outside the Tibet Autonomous Region into uh, uh, Tibet Autonomous Region from Kamen Amdo areas into Central Tibet so that these people, those traditionally uh, the Tibetan monasteries had students from all over Tibet but after uh, the Chinese in the new system they tried to stop Tibetan from outside the Tibet Autonomous Region uh, uh, into coming and getting admitted into the monasteries in the Central Tibet. Then the monastic governance system was uh, changed from one of uh, the monks uh, administra administrating administration to one of uh, communist appointed democratic management committees. And uh, as we heard uh, about China's usage of the Tulku system, the monastic governance system, uh, uh, the recognition of the uh, religious, uh, religious leaders, re, uh, enlightened uh, beings, was changed from one to controlling by China, adopt, adapt, adopting it at its own way and now claiming authority over the selection of the next Dalai Lama. Again, if you look at the Chinese uh, constitution, Article 36 clearly says that uh, everybody enjoy freedom of religious belief. That is qualified by saying that it should be with the normal religious act uh, activities. Now that normal, what is normal, is something that the Chinese authorities themselves define. These are some images of uh, China's initial attempt to destroy uh, Tibetan monastic structure. Now, one way of uh, controlling Tibetan Buddhist practice was usage of uh, normal systems like a traffic control system to monitor the people's uh, movement and to sort of uh, take them into task if they are seen uh, doing anything that the Communist Party is uh, trying to prescribe uh, the people. Now, why is this religious teaching important and what, what is Chinese authorities trying to do? This is from the Dalai Lama's uh, interview. He says, without proper teachers and proper training, keeping up a religion is very difficult. Prior to 1959, there were outstanding scholars in Tibet, but most of them were arrested, some were killed, some fled. Today, in Tibet, the very few learned religious masters that are there are mostly, almost majority of them are uh, monks 
and Tulkus who have been educated before 1959. There are very few of them, the new teachers. If at all, there are some day, there are some who have gone uh, after being educated in India and gone back to uh, Tibet. What is China trying to attempt to show? When Chinese, China uh, always says that there is religious freedom in Tibet and then to sort of uh, support their case, they try to say they show monks doing prayers in the monasteries or people circumambulating uh, uh, the monasteries to show that there is religious freedom. But this is what His Holiness says. The danger is that religion becomes a mere ritual. It's not sufficient to ring a bell, you know. Monks have to master the doctrine and the meditation. They need to be good in both. This requires thorough training. That is what's lacking in uh, Tibet today. And their use of uh, surveillance equipment, we, I think we heard enough of this today, uh, is a way they control Tibet uh, Buddhism. Then patriotic re-education is something that the Chinese authorities use as a way to control Tibetan Buddhism to make into Chinese Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, they now have a database we heard about earlier of Tibetan, what they call living Buddhas, the reincarnated beings. This is uh, the website where you can go and search for uh, China's own officially recognized reincarnation. Again, they control Tibetan uh, Buddhist activities through uh, search engines like the one they have created in Tibetan called Yongzin. And if you type, for example, here I've typed Dalai Lama in Tibetan, and you, you can see what we you can find there below. There's none of these show where His Holiness the Dalai Lama. These are old historical uh, things. Then, people's movement is curbed by using of drones to monitor the border areas, uh, so that... Uh, People who were early able to escape from Tibet to India to via Nepal are now no longer able to do so. Now they are trying to control uh, Tibetans from further uh, continuing their religious practice by saying that children and students and uh, go government officials cannot attend religious activities. Now, this in total is the summation of what uh, I uh, try to put up there. No? Uh, what is Tibetan identity? And what is China trying to do to this Tibetan identity? And if you look at these and usage of high-tech uh, suppressive methods, what can be done? Uh, I try to look up ways, since we are in Geneva and since the United Nations is over here, we need to find a way in which the United Nations and the international community can talk about such usage of high-tech uh, uh, suppression method. And there are two basic ways that I can think we can uh, try to see if the United Nations and the international community can do. First of all, uh, there's UN has a debate on digital surveillance where we can uh, try to uh, put the Tibetan uh, issue uh, into the discussion there. Secondly, there's something called less lethal weapons and related equipment guide, guidelines. This is uh, basically aimed at governments which use such methods to, uh, uh, for a policing uh, situation within the country. Although this may not be directly related to what we, uh, what we are seeing in Tibet today, we can still find a way to put uh, the Tibetan issue into there. Secondly, uh, crowd control system or surveillance camera, etc., may not fit into what is called the dual use technology. But we might still try to see if in that discussion of dual use technology we can put such uh, methods as usage of drones or surveillance cameras as a way of China's controlling uh, the Tibetan uh, Buddhists. Then the, at the political level, Governments and the United Nations should need to strongly uh, support the Tibetan Buddhist system of finding our own reincarnation, including that of the Dalai Lama, in the way Tibetans have traditionally done. The United States has already come out with statements which clearly say that it's the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan Buddhists who have the sole authority to decide on Tibetan Buddhist reincarnation. That needs to be uh, 
come out from the United Nations as well as from uh, governments throughout the world. More importantly, the Tibetan religious freedom is a part of the broader solution of the Tibetan problem, which has been uh, uh, not seen a solution since 1959. And for, to do that, the governments need to support a political solution to the Tibetan issue through uh, currently the uh, Tibetan leadership is uh, following this middle way pathway. They are for dialogue with the Chinese government to resolve the issue. And that needs to be supported by government throughout uh, the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pujula. Uh, Pujula spoke at length on essence of what religious freedom mean, particularly in Tibetan context for the Tibetan people, and on how Tibet, Tibetan religious community was and still is being systematically destroyed using various means and nowadays particularly using higher and modern technologies, and also on what we can do to counter these measures by the uh, the People's Republic of China, the government of People's Republic of China. Thank you very much, Pujunla. And next, I would request uh, Ms. Annie Yang. And before I do that, I'll just uh, share with you a brief kind of introduction of Ms. Annie Yang. Ms. Annie Yang, a graduate of the Beijing Institute of Technology University, University is a former labor camp inmate and Falun Gong practitioner. In 2005, she was arrested for her involvement in Falun Gong spiritual movement, members of which were persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party beginning 1999. She was sent to a forced labor camp for two years without trial, where she was tortured and deprived of basic human rights. Following international pressure, Annie Young was released six months early and moved to the United Kingdom in 2006 and has not been able to go back to China since. Stage is yours, Ms. Yang, please. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation and it is my great honor to be here today. I just gave a brief introduction of Falun Gong and the persecution and my own understanding on uh, high-tech repression on people's faith in China. I think a majority of the people probably know what Falun Gong is. It's just a spiritual belief and based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. On the 1st March 2005, at around 7.30 p.m., and someone knocked my door. So when I opened the door, seven or eight men burst into my house. And only one of them with a police uniform. The rest of them are all plain clothes. And I don't know where do they come from. And they start searching my house. They took all my Falun Gong books materials, my computer, and my printers away. When they finished searching, it was a quarter to one a.m. I was a single mother. And my son, they, they arrested me in front of my 16 years old son. And they, they left my son and took me away to the local police station. And the next day, they take me to the local detention center. I stayed there for 40 days, 40 days after. One day I was told I was giving two years of forced labor without a lawyer, without court. As a labor camp, what they do is just force Falun Gong practitioners to renounce their belief. Because we refu refused to do it, so they took all my basic human rights, 
each meal, I was only given half of Chinese sour bun, which is equal to one slice of bread. During that time, it was a summer. Summer was very hot, 40 degrees. So for 24 hours, I only allowed to have one bottle of water like this. And without permission, I was not allowed to move. There's a, I was forced to sit on the stool, which surface was very uneven, and with a rule sitting there. The knee must be close, the back has to be very straight, and put the double hand on the knee, and the eyes are not allowed to close. Not allowed to move for over 18, to 18 hours a day. If I want to drink, I have to ask the drug addicts the permission, say report class leader, I want to drink. And then if they she says yes, and then I took the cup and drink it. After drinking, I need another permission to put the cup back. Under the 40 degree, I was not allowed to wash my hair, to change my clothes, to take a shower for two weeks until I start hunger strike without water and uh, food. In the one way, they torture me physically and mentally. In another way, they check my body every three months, include blood pressure, chest x-rays, kidney, and uh, heart, and the urine, and the blood, everything. I was quite confused until I came to abroad and realized there's organ harvesting from living Falun Gong practitioners. Because of being a Falun Gong practitioner, we don't smoke, we don't drink, and we exercise, so our body is very healthy. Organ harvesting has been exposed by the two Davids, Kyogo and Metas. Falun Gong practitioners around the world has been contacting their MPs and the government, but no one really believes us, or they might, but they don't want to confront it. The end of this year, the China Tribunal has issued the final judgment, and this is the first time a judge agreed the large organ harvesting does exist. It's, uh, earlier, there's a few uh, speakers already talked about this uh, surveillance and uh, high tech. I just uh, um, give a few details about um, ID card chips inserted. Once the Falun Gong practitioner has been arrested, their ID card has a chip inserted in it, will flag up that they are Falun Gong. From the Minghui.org website, it has been reported that some practitioners were arrested at the checkpoints of railway stations when police checked their ID card. A mobile monitored. The mobile monitored is like even you take your battery out, so this can still listen what you say. An emotion monitor, this is a new form of surveillance device, can be detected people's emotion in a dark, very dark place very clearly. This has been used in cinema and theaters. This RFID recognition, this has only come about recently. I heard from the, I learned from the news. The new generation ID card in Hong Kong has this function. So the police use a portable sensing device can read uh, personal information in the, in the card with a certain distance to identify who they are. This also re reported recently by the Wall Street Journal. This is in the Zhejiang province. The student at a, from a primary school 
uh, forced to put on band, uh, put a band on their head. And you can see there's a light in the middle. If the, right, the, the light is red, means it shows a student concentrated listening. And if the color is blue, less concentration. If the color is white, this means the connection is not very good. The bank band collect the data and send where somewhere to analyze people's thinking. Thinking is not certain where the data is saved and how it's used. I think that I believe this is the direction of how the Chinese Communist Party control people's thinking in the future. <coughs> The Communist Party objective is to use high tech for controlling people in every aspect, including their eating, living, and the people's thinking, and even the world. And also this high tech resulted in more and more people being arrested. Chinese Communist Party just want to destroy people's belief. I think the only way to protect religion's belief is to disintegrate the Chinese Communist Party. And we need more pressure from the international community. Since this persecution started uh, in 1999, all the state media involved slandering Falun Gong, including some media abroad. Therefore, therefore, Falun Gong practitioners set up some media to tell people the truth and expose the persecution. So we set up a New Tang Dynasty uh, television, Epoch Times, uh, his uh, website, uh, Sound of Hope, and the Warren uh, Vision Times. Falun Gong practitioner has been severely persecuted for over 20 years, but so far what has the international community done, including the American White House, governments around the world, United Nations, apart from passing some resolutions and criticizing orally, Nothing has been done that's realistic. That's why none of the criticism works to stop the persecution. There's a trade war between China and America since last year. What forced China to sit in front of the negotiation table? Tariffs. No resolutions passed one after another, but they don't make the Chinese government feel any pain. Why the world doesn't have any real action on the issue of persecution and remains silent because of money and trade? I'm very sorry to say that. Look at the Hong Kong, look at the situation in Hong Kong. Now, how many governments stand out to condemn the violence? Organ harvesting from living Falun Gong practitioners and now include Uyghurs. It is unprecedented crime on this earth, but the world just turned a blind eye. Whoever wants to do the business with China, in fact, they are dealing with a criminal state. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Young. Uh, Ms. Young, amongst other things, spoke on the basic background on Falun Gong, and uh, also shared with us her personal ordeal of how she was harassed, ultimately arrested, and then put into labor camp where she suffered immense hardship. Ms. Young also spoke on the primary reason behind why the Falun Gong practitioners are subject to organ harvesting by Chinese government, and also on the artificial intelligence and other high-end technologies being used to control and repress the people inside China. Thank you very much, Ms. Yang. And our next speaker we have is uh, Mr. Dolgun Issa. 
Mr. Dolgun Issa is a former student leader of the pro-democracy demonstrations in East Turkestan in 1988. After having endured persecution at the hands of Chinese government, Mr. Issa fled China in 1994 and sought asylum in Europe and acquired German citizenship in 2006. Currently, he is the president of the World Uyghur Congress and vice president of the unrepresented nations and people's organization, the UNPO. He has consist consistently advocated for the rights of Uyghur people and has raised the issue in the United Nations, the institutions of the European Union and in individual states and other international fora. Mr. Issa, please. Thank you. I would like to I would like to thanks to invite me uh, this uh, conference to speak here share the Uyghur case and I thanks to Tibet office and the Tibet administrations uh, I'm also very happy today I met so many of my old friends and Buchung Kilsang and uh, Prime Minister of Sangsangi I was in uh, Prague just uh, last two, two, three weeks ago uh, with the Prime Minister together here and after three weeks later again here. Uh, next week we will again meet in the Halifax in Canada. Uh, so we, it is that maybe Chinese government is not very happy on this, but we cannot nothing to do. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm also not expert or also a high tech or surveillance uh, technology, but I'm personally victim of this in exile. My family victim of this in East Turkestan, in Ayhamdam. Today, an estimated three million innocent Uyghur are being arbitrarily detained in the 21st century concentration camp by the Chinese authority. Well, Chinese government until last year, uh, not this year, uh, no, last year, October denied everything. No, we don't have access to anything. But after the growing up the international pressure, then change the narrative all the time. Oh, it is not detention or concentration camp. It is a vocational training center. But so many intellectual, so many Uyghur professor, for example, President of the Xinjiang University, Tashpala Tief. Today, also Amnesty International published urgent action a couple of weeks ago, uh, did once, and he is sentenced to death. He no need to eradicate it. President of the Xinjiang Medical University, Hal Murat, he is sentenced to death in the concentration camp today. He no need to for uh, uh, eradication or vocational training. So then, Chinese government change the narrative saying, well, it is campaign against the terrorism and the radicalism. So all the time change the narrative. Uh, but these people, more than three million people, uh, have not been charged with any crime, provided with lawyer or given any trials. They have been detained because of very born Uyghurs. They are completely innocent people. They are of mother, brother, sister, and singer, uh, teachers, religious figures, yes, everyone, businessmen, musician, ordinary people, because they are detained because of the ethnicity, because they are Uyghurs. I would like to uh, tell this uh, opportunity I told uh, already you is my personal story. I left my country in 1994. Since the 26 years, 25 years, more than I'm in the exile. I'm doing Active, active activism. I am trying to be a voice of my people in the internationally. Because of this, my family and uh, pays the price, punished. I have never seen my family since 25 years. I couldn't return. I invite my family a couple of times, but Chinese government never gives a passport to a lot of them visit to Germany. You know, you are some other place. And. Uh, I say, even I couldn't. Today, China is a high-tech country. Chinese government use internet and they use high-tech surveillance around the world, all the people, but I couldn't benefit this. I couldn't talk once by video, talk with my parents. 
since 25 years. But last year, 2018, I got heartbreaking news. My mother was died. A lot of international media called me. What condition your mother was died? In the camp, I have no idea. After I got this news, even my mother died 17 of May 2018, but I could learn this, break, this news nearly three weeks later. I got 12th of June. After I got this news, I had trying to call to communicate it, contact my family member, rest of. I want to learn, but I couldn't still, I couldn't get any news. Just a few weeks later, I learned from the international media, my mother put in the concentration camp around May in June 2017. After one year later, she died in the camp. She was 78 years old, ladies. You know, how, I don't know how, what kind of physical torture, or psychological torture for him, for her, and what condition she died. I have no idea still. And another issue. Today is 21st century. Communication is not issue at all. In China, is everybody, everywhere is camera, everywhere is uh, high tech in the internet. But I don't know. My 90 years old father still alive or died. No. I refused to get information on the, my father's alive or died. I asked the German Foreign Ministry, State Department, U.S. and the. European Union all, they, are, they have trying to get information. I didn't ask them to save my family, just to get information. But I couldn't. Still I couldn't. So I have no idea how many family members still alive, how many family members is died, what condition. Uh, I don't know. This is the uh, situation today. In the past five years, particularly, we have witnessed strategy of the Chinese government shift to social reengineering of the Uyghur people. Everything that makes Uyghur people unique or language, cultural, religious has been targeted. Young generation of the Uyghurs is being targeted, particularly in doctrinations. Religious freedom, particularly Islam value, tradition as uh, most, uh, most targeted by the Chinese uh, government. And uh, Xi Jinping is the Chinese government saying Islam is illness, ideological illness. It must be eradicated. This Chinese government openly says this, but unfortunately so many, because China today, really, uh, Chinese ideology is anti-religious. Of course, today is Falun Gong, Chinese Christian, Tibet Buddhist, and Uyghur Muslim, all we have a, a religious problem, a religious persecution. But particularly for the Islam, particularly all a, a religious belief targeted and uh, really strongly. Even, you know, during the Ramadan time last year, or not only last year, since 2015, fasting is forbidden, completely forbidden. During the lunch time, Chinese government provide water on lunch, forced it to drink, eat. You cannot find an example around the world. You want to eat something, you don't eat, your personal choice. Even today, Chinese government decide how you dress. Women cannot uh, 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 scrub, uh, you know, <laughs> cannot just long dress. Men, you cannot uh, grow a beard. But Marx, Lenin, and Stalin, this is the father of the communism, they have a long beard. If you today, if you grow with blood, how you are uh, 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 radical, you are terrorists, you are fundamentalists. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of, most of some uh, Muslim country continue silence. Not only silence, even support the Chinese policy, Chinese government, repression policy towards the Uyghurs. Yeah. And the Xi Jinping leadership, uh, and appointed party secretary Ching Chiang this is the guy, you all know who is Ching Chiang Ching Chiang was the party secretary in Tibet from 2011 to 2016. During he was the party secretary in Tibet, he used brutal way to the Tibetan people. You know? So then 2016, this guy was appointed 
party secretary in Estrukistan, so-called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, then he established really high-tech surveillance, uh, surveillance uh, system in. He and strongly uh, implemented so-called eradication camp in the 21st century uh, concentration camps. Today, Estrukistan has essentially become a police state. It is one of the most heavy police, police areas around the world. The Chinese government has invested billions of renminbi in the high-tech security technology. Chinese government is employing both one side human surveillance through the use of spies or some other uh, method, other is advantage technological surveillance and it is aimed to create the most comfortable, uh, completely surveillance state in the history. 10,000 of uh, new police and military personnel have been sent to the control Uyghur population, and the dense network of the police station, roadblocks, checkpoint, ensuring absolutely control of the Uyghur population. We have also witnessed mass collected personal date from the CCTV scanners, facial recognition software, public database, police checkpoint from DNA and the blood sample, which is analyzed using artificial intelligence and large data hopes. Many today describe Eastern standards testing ground or laboratory of the, for the Chinese policy, as well as for the use of surveillance technology and the collection of personal data, data to track individuals belong to the particular ethnic group. You know, and uh, uh, Madam Yang already talking about the organ harvesting issue. Uh, well, Eastern Uyghur people is uh, one of the and, uh, victims for the long time. And the Chinese government used first that is organ harvesting from the Uyghurs. And recently, yes, Chinese government also has some advertisement saying is halal organ harvesting, halal organ transplant. It is meaning is that some rich man from Arabic country, Muslim country, use a need a organ, but halal organ. Look. Well, actually, this is Chinese government um, and uh, is this uh, surveillance uh, technology and the targeting of the Uyghurs not just start in 2017 because so-called so radiation camp concentration camp start 2017, but it is a, has a long history. Since uh, 2014, Chinese government launched Strike Hard campaign. No. Help me. Well, uh, the Chinese government start, uh, launches a uh, strike hard campaign against the violence terrorism in Turkestan. China must arrest 100,000 Uyghurs in 2014. And uh, also, people in Turkestan are content just uh, over the less than one percentage hold the uh, total Chinese population uh, in China population. But human rights. Ah, okay. From this, this oh, it's be, beginning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This point. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, but human rights defender, one of the NGO, their report is done that 21 percentage criminal whole and the number is 21 percentage in the Turkestan Uyghurs. Population is less than one percentage, but the 21 percent all criminal from East Turkestan. This is Chinese things. <coughs> then between June and, June and November 2017, and the regional government collected DNA samples and the fingerprints, iris scans, and blood tapes, all entire population in East Turkestan, between age 12 to 65 years old. And the program called Physical for All. 
and which offered free of charge medical examination to the resident so-called Xinjiang Uyghur Optimist region. Yes. And the Chinese government official announced that and this uh, uh, is physical for all this program, uh, joined 11 million. So, so the Chinese government is calling is Uyghur population 11.6 million. So it is nearly all the Uyghur and uh, uh, already gives a DNA sample and the blood sample. And since August 2016, police and the other government officials used Integrate Joint Operation Platform, IJOP. This, uh, Mr. Philip already explained on this and uh, his presentation. Uh, and uh, this, this IJOP gathers information from multiple resources, including from CCTV cameras and with some facial recognition capacity some cameras are positioned in location police consider sensi uh, sensitive like entertainment venue supermarket school home religious figures yes and uh, i job also received information like license uh, plate numbers and the uh, uh, citizen id card number from some other regions countless security checkpoint v uh, visitor management system also uh, implemented in access control communities from the vehicle ownership, health, family planning, banking, legal records. And, uh, you know, in the, since the 2006, after Cheng Cheng Go, uh, came to the Estrukistan as a party secretary, and the new system, just check your mobile phone, smartphone. On the street, and the police, you can stop. Not only control your ID, Ask your iPhone or your smartphone. Please, you give me your mobile phone. You know, then check your mobile phone and it, it searching everything. If find any word related to religious or something, then immediately the problem. Pussy, pussy, pussy camps. So that's why 2016, 2017, people are afraid to use a smartphone. Smartphone because you don't know. Sometimes it's accidentally someone sent you some pictures, something, then is a problem for you. Sometimes police put something, check during the uh, check your mobile phone, put something, huh, what is this? Then is this the excuse to uh, you put to the camp. Then that's why 2016, 2017, and the old patient without internet is just the old, old no car telephone is getting expensive than smartphone in East Turkestan. But 2018, Chinese government and uh, uh, developed new uh, 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 app, app and asked everyone must be download the smartphone. Then cannot, you cannot use all the patient, no, uh, you, you cannot use all the patient uh, mobile phone. You must use the smartphone. Because China very easily government tracking you. What are you doing? Yeah. And the other resource, Chinese government used the internet and the uh, Wi-Fi uh, system with collectors, unique identifying address, computers, and the other network devices. Yes, this is the checkpoint. After Xi Jinping uh, uh, and, uh, appointed the Ching Chiang as the party secretary, First thing he did in East Turkestan is stop this checkpoint, so-called and the police convention uh, convent center. Actually, it is police monitor center. Only Yurimchi, capital of East Turkestan, within four months he established 960 police monitor station. It is mean every two three hundred meter one police monitor station. And also, you look, this is the uh, checkpoint, and the, uh, all the big mosques have sh should uh, put such an uh, X-ray system, X-ray system. But un unfortunately, today, this, this, this system was in the 2016, 2017, and beginning of 2018. But since 2019, most of some mosque is closed. People f are fear to go to the mosque. 
and also Chinese government issue some special ID who make prayer and who and want to the mosque you should have an ID special ID then this ID must be provided by the police office or the local government. If you go to apply this ID and you had a lot of problems. That's why people are afraid to get the ID who, which you use to the mosque and they just apply at home or some other place. Then Chinese government say, oh, most of some mosque is empty. No one is coming. Then 2017, 2018, more than 5,000 more, more than 5,000 mosques was destroyed. 5,000. Even some mosque, 700 years, 800 years old, cultural heritage. So destroyed. And uh, we don't know exactly how many checkpoints was established, but uh, it is saying, some say 7,500 checkpoints around East Turkestan. Uh, but we know in the only Urumqi, one city, 960. Maybe definitely more than uh, 10,000 checkpoints uh, in East Turkestan. So Robin Van well, uh, Verl is the director of the Inside Chinese Digital Gulag say, China plans to establish Xinjiang style surveillance system across the country. We know that Beijing has ambitions, plans to develop vast nations surveillance system in mainland China based on facial recognition to track, track and identify uh, it is 1.4 billion citizens through the vast network CCTV cameras. And also, uh, BBC reported on 2017 uh, saying there are 170 million camera. 170 million camera already in the place. And the plan is to install 400 million camera over the next three years. It is the BBC a report, uh, well, it is, I don't know, it is a huge number, 160, 70 million, and for, it is means today is every 12 person have one surveillance cameras. Uh, if we really 400 million, then it is meaning every three people one camera, yeah. Yes, this is the shopping center, mosque area, and the camera. It is only one mosque is wanted more than 20 camera. And the Chinese government, another surveillance uh, strategy to the uh, Uyghurs. Since 2016, Chinese government used and, uh, and this Chinese Communist Party to the home visit home visit. So many Uyghurs and uh, in the camps, the concentration camp, and uh, some children or women at the home. And the Chinese Communist Party member visits the home, some not like is this visiting them, and the United Family, you know, United Family. And sometimes, because all tradition, some men cannot visit the Uyghur family if there is no Uyghur man. It is all tradition, or religious, so, you know. But Chinese Communist Party appointed and firstly Chinese Communist Party member visits the Uyghur family, not only with staying, staying a week, two weeks, and months, and monitoring what they are doing at home. Surveillance and report it and brainwashing, indoctrinate everything and eating together. We are Muslim, we don't eat pork. But since 2018, Chinese government implemented anti halalism. So today you cannot saw any sign on the street in the restaurant halal. It's forbidden. You know, you have to eat pork. Today, if you're sitting together with some other Chinese friend, 
on the table, someone offer you to eat the pork, no, no, I don't eat pork, then you radicalize. You are terrorist. Immediately have a problem. Maybe you are vegetarian, you know? But doesn't matter. If you don't eat, then problem. And offering you drink and the offers of alcohol, you cannot refuse. No, I don't. Huh, you are radical, you are terrorist immediately. Look. And is this Chinese Communist Party members who are staying in the visiting the Uyghur family and they're cooking together? Look. Sounds not like, yes, and the cooking and the staying together like from family. Yeah. And the first two, and the, this year, 2019, and the Chinese Spring Festival time, Chinese, just every Uyghur family have one Chinese relatives, so called relatives. She bring some present. It is gift, it is food, and the pork. You have to cook together, you have to eat this. And the other thing is forced marriage. Well, so this the Chinese Communist Party members who are staying with the Uyghur family and staying together, so many rape was happening. So many rape was happening. But you cannot accuse. You know? If you accused, then ha. Huh? You will be terrorist, you will be radicalized, you will be nationalist, immediately charge this. So, and the, today, one Chinese, guys, if you came to your home saying, oh, I want to marry you girl, you cannot, you cannot refuse. You must be accepted. Look, this is the, this is the one, one of the uh, videos of this, uh, this picture, left side. This lady is crying. You know, this Chinese man, this is the uh, big, and the, in the social media was published last year. So today is so many first marriages happening uh, in East Turkestan. Well, this is the, the caricature of one of some Chinese friends. This is Jungo, it is China. Whole China is a jail. It is the surveillance area, but inside is Xinjiang. This is the Inside is, is Turkestan. It's so big different. No, it is the things. Well, as I said at the beginning, I'm victim. I told you, my, I'm not the expert of the high-tech surveillance uh, system, but I'm victim. My family victim inside, I'm victim outside China. Today, Chinese government monitoring all my activism. Huh? This morning at the opening, Prime Minister already mentioned how China is trying to implement and uh, 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 manipulate the UN system. Yes, I'm the victim of this. I couldn't enter, I'm the German citizen. But because of the Chinese pressure, I couldn't enter so many countries today. I was kicked out from the United Nations, New York, 2017, 2018. Huh? I have accreditation, everything. Chinese government, time to time, make pressure secretary at Human Rights Council, Geneva as well, trying to be kicked out. I was detained so many border, country border. 2009, when I was invited to one of the conference in the South Korea, I was detained in South Korea for, for a night. Chinese government asked me, deported to China. But US State Department and the German Foreign Ministry really did hard job, and the last minute, they saved my life. I was deported, deported to Germany. 2007, okay, this is Asian country, some other country, but 2017, July, I was detained in Italy, Rome, middle, middle of Europe. Even 2005, I was detained in Geneva as well. Huh? <laughs> Tibetan friends organized demonstration, during the Human Rights Council's meeting, I joined it, I made a statement. After statement, suddenly is Swedish police coming to check my idea, give, took me the car, uh, six hours questioned. After six hours, I was released. 2017 is the same thing as what's happening in Rome, Italy. I was invited to Senator Campani. He invited me to the jointly press conference, Italian Senate building. 
Just 20 minutes before starting the conference, I came to the Italian Senate building. More than 20 Italian police took me. Took my fingerprint, took my pictures, like treated terrorists, really. You know? Then after three and a half hours later, after intervention in German government, German ambassador room, then I was released. Yeah. So it is the situation today. Chinese government not only surveillance, used the high technology and they make pressure Tibetan, Uyghur, Hong Kongs, and some other people in, in, inside China, in Turkestan, Tibet, and the outside. Outside also. Also trying to use the economic power and, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, manipulate, undermine the UN human rights system as well, unfortunately. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Issa, amongst other things, he spoke on how Chinese government kept on, keep on, in, in fact, changing narrative to persecute Uyghur people. And he also shared with us that he, despite being in free country for many years, is still suffering, or he still suffers psychologically in not being able to meet and talk with his families back home in East Turkestan, and it is very unfortunate that his parents either died or killed in the, uh, at the hand of Chinese authorities, and he doesn't know whether uh, he, they were killed or they, they just died and how they were killed, you know. It is a really sad thing to know. Yeah. And uh, he also spoke on how the party secretary in East Turkestan replicates, you know, is replicating the repressive method that he used in Tibet when he was party secretary back in uh, Tibet Autonomous Region. And he also spoke at length on various high-end technologies being used in East Turkestan to repress and control people like the authorities do in Tibet. And I really thank uh, Mr. Dolgun Issa for sharing your exhaustive presentation on persecution being suffered by our Yuga brethren at the hand of Chinese authorities. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Thank, thank you. you very much. Next, we have the final speaker, Mr. Marco Respinti. Mr. Respinti is an Italian professional journalist essayist, translator, and lecturer. He contributes to several journals and magazines, both in print and online, both in Italy and abroad. One of his books, published in 2008, concerns human rights in China. A senior fellow at the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal, a nonpartisan, nonprofit U.S. educational organization based in Macosta, Michigan. He is also a founding member as well as a board member of the Center for European Renewal, a non-profit, non-partisan, pan-European educational organization based in The Hague, the Netherlands. He serves as director in charge of the Journal of Sessner and Beta, Beta Winter. Mr. Marco was awarded the 2019 Pharma stands for International Festival of Religious, Religions, Music and Arts Award for Journalism Promoting Religious Liberty to honor personalities who promoted religious liberty and interreligious dialogue throughout the world. Mr. Espendi, please. Thank you. Distinguished hosts, authorities, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, namaste. It is an honor and a pleasure to be part of this important panel, and believe me, it's not easy to speak now, after the touching personal testimonies of friends all they knew. May the world listen to the believer's cry for liberty that rises from this room today. Skynet, sharp eyes, operation knocking on doors, web cleaning soldier, these are just some of the terms used by China, China's state security to describe the draconian 
surveillance systems deployed to identify, monitor, track, and persecute scores of millions of Chinese citizens, especially ethnic minorities and religious groups. China's high-tech surveillance technologies and systems employ advanced artificial, in artificial intelligence to process and analyze massive amounts of data collected from facial recognition, DNA sampling, biometrics, GPS, ubiquitous high-resolution CCTV cameras, intrusive mobile phone apps, desktop computer software, smart TVs, and drones. However, these high-tech capabilities are also combined with the old-fashioned networks of informants, a constant and invasive police presence, outposts, and patrols, all integrated, integrated with massive computerized databases. At this point of the day, nothing is new for you. Nothing of this is new for you. Excuse also some repetitions even in pictures. The only original contribution I can hope to give now is some organization in this whole material, as well as some focus on targeting religions in China. Writing on Bitter Winter, Mr. Paul Crespo has provided in-depth analysis of this problem, and while thanking him publicly, I abundantly rely here on his expertise. Mr. Crespo is an American foreign affairs and international security expert, writer, and communication consultant with nearly 30 years of experience working for the U.S. government as well as corporate and not-for-profit organization. In his opinion, the Chinese surveillance system is composed primarily of three tracks. First, massive unprecedented collection of personal data. Second, near, near total surveillance via technical and human means. And third, data analysis and management via advanced IE, and artificial intelligence, and military style coordination operation. The final goal is a sophisticated national database allowing security forces to track, analyze, and control every individual in China in real or near real time. While many aspects of these surveillance systems are being employed throughout China, as my friend Tolkien knows quite well, Xinjiang has, has been and he is the testing ground or laboratory for some of the most intrusive and repressive techniques. Xinjiang is the region which Uyghurs prefer to call East Turkestan, home of, the mo of most of the country's Uyghur Muslim population. Well, in 2017, Chinese President Xi Jinping declared that he was creating, quote, a wall of steel, end quote, around the region. Once proven in Xinjiang, these systems are often rolled out to other regions of China. Fergus Ryan, an analyst and China expert at the, at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute say that the technology has been deployed as, quote, part of Beijing's repression of Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other ethnic minorities, and that Xinjiang was a major testing ground for those types of, types of surveillance technologies, end quote. So first, massive data collection. China has, been, has become the nefarious global leader in collecting extremely sensitive and personal data from its citizens. According to Human Rights Watch, the Chinese administration in Xinjiang is collecting a full range of biometrics, including DNA samples, fingerprints, iris scans, as Dolkin has just said, and blood types of all residents in the region between the ages of 12 and 65 in order to build a region-wide biometric database. This data collection is done primarily via a specially designed mobile app, 
that, physical, that is physical for all that was just mentioned. In 2016, Xinjiang police bureaus also began collecting residents' voice samples for a national voice database that, database that could be used, for example, to identify any voice during recorded phone conversation. For people designated as focus personnel or key individuals, full biometrics samples must be taken regardless of age. According again to Human Rights Watch, the biometric collection scheme is detailed in an official document called the Xinjiang Region Working Guidelines of the, on the Accurate Registration and Verification of Population. As Peter Witter has reported, a major part of China's data collection effort also includes the expensive Dragnet-style Operation Knocking on Doors, launched nationwide in early 2017. This operation sends police officers to investigate and photograph religious believers under false pretext, part of a broader surveillance system to specifically track religious people nationwide. The operation collects information on the activ activities of religious groups listed as Xie Zhao and conducts network surveillance of each believer. Let me just explain briefly what the Xie Zhao is. Often incorrectly translated as evil cults, the expression Xie Zhao, which has been used since the late Ming era, means heterodox teachings and indicates the religious movements included in a special list made by the CCP, which the government regards as hostile to the Chinese Communist Party, dangerous and not really religious. Xie Zhao are then prohibited. Being active in Xie Zhao is punished with several jail penalties under Article 300 of the Chinese Criminal Code. By the way, Falun Gong is listed in, in, as a Xie Zhao. Second, total, total surveillance. As noted by the Los Angeles Times, China has installed 176 million public and private surveillance cameras for its 1.4 billion people, including some on every block in its capital, Beijing. However, China plans to have as many as 626 million cameras installed nationwide by the end of this year. As more CCTV cameras are installed in rural areas and they increasingly incorporate advanced facial and the latest gait, walking style, recognition, China will soon become the world's most monitored society. According to a Free Asia report, the company behind the Sharp Eyes system claims to have developed the platform systems using home televisions and smartphones to push video surveillance into people's home. Third, military style coordination. With data collected on a person's every aspect and movement, artificial intelligence is needed to process the vast volume of information for hundreds of millions of Chinese. AE can trace, uh, quote, can trace patterns, map relationships, and note deviations. For house church leaders, meaning the Protestant churches who don't join the state-controlled church, this make makes it difficult to organize secretly hold services or inform outsiders when persecution occurs, according to Dean Cheng, an expert on China at the Heritage Foundation. Let me skip, because this was just said today. So now religion is are the target. Clearly, high-tech surveillance has become an essential tool for the CCP to control and subjugate society. But a particular sector of society is really the CCP's target. Religion and religious group. Why? Because the CCP sees religion as public enemy number one. You see in this slide a mosque, or a former mosque, one of the most important Buddhist statues who was destroyed recently, and a cross burning atop of a church. To explain the way in which the CCP persecutes religion in China, I rely on Chinese sociologist Dr. Fengang Yang's studies. 
He divides the religious field in China into three sectors, the red market, the gray market, and the black market. This differentiation is not due to a difference in the regime's appreciation of the various faiths, but to the different factual tolerance different groups enjoy or to the regime's practical impossibility to equally crush everyone in the same way at the same time and in the reluctance to do so given the weight some of these groups have. If the red market is therefore the space in which the regime tries to, to tame some groups, infiltrating and controlling them, them from within, through the three self-church for Protestants, the Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association, the China Islamic Association, the China Buddhist Association, and the China Taoist Association, all originally created in the 50s, the gray market is the limbo where the CCP does not manage to intervene so hard. Certainly not by letting things go, but by adopting indirect strategies. This doesn't any way mean that the red market is exempt from repression, which is in fact, in, which in fact is intensifying lately. Neither that the gray market is. In fact, being a member of a religious group of that lot is forbidden, but still does not constitute a crime punishable with harsh penalties. This last area is the space of the black market, where the groups defined as Xi Zhao are relegated. Being a member of the black market group that the government has officially listed as Xi Zhao, where Xi Zhao is tautologically any group which is, which is listed as a Xi Zhao, and groups can come and go from the list of Xi Zhao, is a crime punished with unprecedented severity. It is in this area that the cruelest and often ignored killings of people from groups such as the Falun Gong and the Church of the Almighty God have been carried and continue to take place. Both groups are also subjected to the gruesome practices of forced organ harvesting that feeds the illegal trade. Well, the People's Republic of China, which, it, which turned 70 years old on October the 1st this year, has waged the war on the very idea of God since its first day. In fact, Communist China has always judged religion as unnatural illness, as Tolkien said, and thus sooner or later doomed to extinction. While awaiting, awaiting this fate, the CCP has contributed to reaching the ex extinction of religion with varying, varying degrees of harshness depending on times, leaders, national and international contexts. The new era of Xi Jinping favors a rapid acceleration with a direct assault on faiths, both those banned or somewhat tolerated and those approved and controlled by the state. This means one thing only. The CCP considers God its very enemy because, because God is a direct rival of the CCP in spite of the fact that the Chinese constitution grants nominally religious freedom. God must be extinct. In the meantime, the Chinese government is making believers become extinct. This is especially true after the passing of the new regulation on religious affairs the most restrictive Chinese law on religious matters on February the 1st, 2018. Now technology, now technology enters. In fact, high-tech devices are today providing the CCP the best of all means to harass believers and to repress religion. Technology is a wonderful tool, but it can also be a horrible weapon, even of mass destruction. It is an unprecedented power in the hands of a brutal ideological force. Today we frequently mention DNA sampling and profiling. One could wonder what it is useful for. No one really knows. But what we know for sure, and we have witnesses at this table, is that the Chinese regime has been and is involved in the nightmare of human harvesting or the explant of organs from the bodies of prisoners of conscience to feed the black market of illegal transplant. We know that thousands and thousands of people have been killed and or used in this way 
especially Falun Gong practitioner, and now also members of the Church of the Almighty God, Uyghurs, other Turkic Muslim minorities, and possibly also Tibetans. For sure, DNA, DNA profiling may be very useful for this harvest of sorrow. <clears throat> Let me conclude with a final remark concerning the Huawei controversy. A bitter winter we deal only with religious liberty and human rights. Politics is not our business. Trade is not our business. But what, but what may seem to be only an episode for, of the trade war between the United States and China brings back to light another question of primary importance. Perhaps the Chinese telecommunications giants are the operative arm of Beijing's repressive Big Brother, useful to control refugees abroad, dissidents at home, and Westerners everywhere. Thanks to the exploitation of the future of the internet that we all rightly dream of, but that we should actually dramatically fear. The point here is not only the fact that Huawei, through, through its evident connection with the regime and its military apparatus, may spy on foreigners and exiles. The point here is that through Huawei, the Chinese regime could literally control the lives of millions of people and decide their fate. In fact, Huawei is working on an interception system not linked just to its product, which one could uh, easily choose not to buy, or, uh, to buy or to use, but based on a global structure that can control any electronic device for communication. To make it available to the Chinese giant in a relatively simple way would be to upgrade the internet to the 5G technology meaning fifth generation. 5G will be, in fact, the first system able to unite the Internet of People and the Internet of Things, since the same towers that will manage smartphones, tablets, and PCs will also manage hospital, traffic, electricity networks, as airports, and so on. I choose these, these um, pictures. This is taken from a commercial now airing in, uh, in my country, in Italy. It shows a very famous, from the back, a very famous medical doctor using virtual reality from a, from his, uh, from his smartphone to make a surgical operation miles away. It could be possible through the 5G that Huawei is, uh, is developing. So it's a wonderful thing, but in the same time, as you can save a life doing, you know, from, a bro from far away, you can just push a button and kill how many people you want when everything will be connected or inter interconnected. This is not science fiction. This is coming to our homes, I think, pretty soon. I just landed in Brussels, and the first commercial I saw, huge, was, you know, welcome to the 5G by the Huawei. Tu shai, shitai, chai. Thank you, Mr. Espendi. Uh, Mr. Espendi spoke on how the modern technologies such as advanced artificial intelligence, facial recognition, DNA sampling, biometrics, high resolution CCTV cameras, intrusive mobile phone apps, etc., are being employed by the Chinese government to control and repress Tibetans, Uyghurs, and other religious minorities inside China. And he also spoke at, on, at length on the potential threat of Chinese giant Huawei to global security and human rights, which is of very serious concern to people all over the world. And we must seriously take note of it. I thank you. I thank Mr. Uh, Mr. Raspendi for your exhaustive presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we have about 30 minutes, and uh, it is now time for question and answer session. And I would request the members of the audience to take part in it. Uh, and uh, kindly identify yourself when you pose question to any of the, uh, the eminent panelists here.
please. Um, thank you to all the speakers for your presentation. My name is Searing, I'm a student in Geneva, and it seems that as China is becoming increasingly uh, digitally, digi sorry, digitally connected, um, ironically the people are becoming increasingly disconnected from information, from each other, and from the international community, especially the religious and ethnic minority groups. So I wanted to ask you, um, um, how um, religious and ethnic minorities have or can resist the state's high-tech surveillance and what role does the wider Chinese public play in this or foresee, you foresee them playing in this? Thank you. Uh, is your question directed to Mr. Issa or? Or any it's of the panelists? To, uh, to all the panelists. Oh, okay, okay, fine. Uh, in my humble opinion, they cannot alone. Uh, if the international community doesn't wake up and try to stop these horrible things, they, they, they cannot. Um, religious groups have connection abroad through, you know, different churches or affiliations. They need to interact through that to unite from, with, with people abroad, even if this is a, a real crime for the China uh, law. I mean, if a church is connecting to, a, uh, to some, someone abroad, uh, the accusation of terrorism, it's easy to, to, to get in. But nonetheless, they need to, to unite with the, with the people outside China they need to lobby as much as possible at the international level and, and governments and the UN should find a way, it's not my business, I'm a reporter, but they should find a way of, let me say it frankly, putting ethical tariffs on, on um, trade of electronic components and, and all that. Otherwise, no one could could really stop the situation. I mean, this is a, just a suggestion out of my... Uh, but that, I mean, how can you resist a giant like that with the potential that technology gives to China and the, 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 the historical potential in the number of people and military and all secret services and all that that China has? Uh, I mean, we need, uh, we need the international community to speak out openly. If I may add to this, I think uh, while we may or may not be able to stop the, or the Buddhist practitioners in Tibet, for example, in our case, may or may not be able to stop the Chinese authorities from suppressing the faith inside Tibet, uh, I think the Tibetan Buddhists have uh, the fortune of his Holiness the Dalai Lama and the critical mass of Tibetan Buddhists outside of Tibet who are able to sort of continue to preserve and promote this tradition in exile. And as long as this tradition survives in outside of Tibet, it's always a challenge to China. And so the Chinese would not succeed inside Tibet. Do you want to add something? Yes, please. Well, uh, for the residents of uh, the Chinese high technic uh, repression towards the Uyghur, Tibet, and the Falun Gong as the Chinese people, actually there is a, I think there is a, a lot of responsibility Western uh, government and the Western, uh, particularly Western company. Today, and uh, from the prospect of the Uyghur issue, we say it is more than three million people in the concentration camp, 21st century. Uh, still, most of some countries ignored it. And uh, today, so many companies continue doing business with China, even provide high technology. German company, U.S. company, and uh, some other Western company continue to do business. Business at this moment should not be unusual should be stopped because uh, all the human beings had very horrible uh, experience Second World War, Nazi regime. That time is a lot of company cooperate with the Nazi regime. Then is a, and the result is a million of people is died. And we had a, such a good experience, bad experience of course, it is not good experience, but still 
Same thing is happening in East Turkestan, Tibet, some other part, in Hong Kong, you know? So, so it is the, not only responsibility just of the Uyghurs, Tibet, Hong Kong, and the Chinese people. It is a responsibility of the Western country, and particularly his company. And uh, should be and all the time, it's just, yes, money is important, but human value is, should be most important than, uh, than, than, than money, some other things. So that's why there is some responsibility, and uh, is a Western, is a German company, US company, some Western uh, countries company uh, should be uh, stop, I mean, uh, should not be cooperate with the Chinese government. It's surveillance technologies uh, basically coming from Western technology. <coughs> then China has developed it. So that's why, and uh, of course, this uh, uh, inside inside in China, Tibet, it's very we, particularly in Turkestan, Really, we don't have really no space to residence, you know, because what we say is this BBC say 170 million CCTV cameras around the, uh, the uh, part in China. Does this mean everyone, every minute, every uh, second is monitoring by the Chinese? It is very difficult to, to do something. Is so that's why this, this mostly it is Western country, particularly, and the uh, democratic society, and they should to stand up and uh, make pressure to the government, to the companies, stop this business. May be more useful. Thank you. I have, I have a question to Mr. Respinti. Since your organization is based in Italy, uh, I would like to know your opinion about the report. I think some time last year, there was a news report that the Vatican has uh, reached an agreement with the Chinese government about selection and appointment of uh, Catholic leaders in China. What is your opinion about it? Well, we are based in Italy, but we operate on different continents. Uh, so America, the, 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 the East. Uh, I am a Roman Catholic. I'm a believer and I'm practicing. So will you be satisfied if I say no comment? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, I understand why the, the Vatican tried for many decades to find a way not to, de to, 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 to please the regime, but to unify the church. It's very important to have, you know, uh, a unified church. For, and, uh, and a unified church must be loyal to the Pope. The, if you're Catholic, you understand that quite Easily, so it's very important. So I, I appreciate that effort. Maybe we could do it in another way. Uh, I, I'm. Let me let me add that I am totally convinced that the Vatican tried to do that for the best. But you know, maybe they were not. Uh, they didn't calculate that the CCP is not that honest. And the CCP is always, always interpreting the, the, the deal through this idea. The Vatican gave us permission to unify the two churches, meaning that everyone should join the former Catholic Patriotic Association, which is not true. I mean, um, the, the, the agreement is a secret. We haven't read it. But we, we know from inside sources that the agreement doesn't say that. But the CCP is playing on that key. And uh, the Vatican, for many, too many reasons, uh, doesn't want to, to, to clash d directly with that. But let me just finally say that yesterday, if I'm not wrong, yesterday or the day before, La Croix, which is a, a famous French weekly journal, said uh, it tend, uh, they tend to be always in favor of what the Vatican says. They just publish a, an important feature article saying maybe not, now enough is enough. Well, Prosecution didn't stop. Uh, I, I mean, so. What?
Mr. Issa, I wonder if the word genocide is appropriate to use in the context of China's treatment of, of uh, the Uyghurs? Yes, it is uh, some and uh, uh, genocide that today Chinese government really uh, is. Uh, we believe it is the uh, implemented on the it is a genocide. Uh, now, uh, of course, some international media calls this is the genocide. Some is the crime against the humanity. Uh, this all happening and uh, in Turkestan for the Uyghurs, uh, but. Uh, well, I'm not a uh, person's uh, legal uh, uh, basis, so now is uh, we working some international criminal lawyers, and uh, we believe some international lawyer and the, uh, and the ju 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 judgment and working on this case, you know. So hopefully and. Uh, uh, Yes, and uh, we are as a p p activist, I'm the other activist or political, then we can say, but it is really what is the definition? It is the Chinese government doing as Turkestan should be uh, give some name for the by the judgment or the uh, or lawyer. It is the, uh, uh, important for us. No, is working on this case, yes. I'm sorry, since there's nobody raising hand to ask a question. Oh, please. I just wanted to add, I think the lady there asked about what the international community could do also, I think, early, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in which case, I think one thing that governments, particularly the European governments and the free democratic governments can do is, uh, the United States had two ministerials for religious freedom, and they've started a religious freedom alliance of governments. I think if you can encourage your government to be part of that religious freedom alliance, an international coalition of religious freedom uh, advocates can be built that can sort of uh, uh, work together against China's uh, religious uh, persecution. Uh, now this we recommend, instead of having a bilateral approach, in dealing with China, you must have multilateral approach. Bilateral approach, you get you know outmaneuvered and outsmarted uh, by the Chinese government. Uh, so, using European Union or United Nations, other multilateral agencies, to have several countries come together to confront on human rights violation is perhaps more effective. Now, my question is uh, for my friend Dokum. Uh, you said 5,000 mosques were destroyed. Uh, what happened to all the imams? Number two, and what, what is the number of, you know, uh, total number of mosques um, in, in, in East Turkestan? Yes, and uh, we, uh, it's reportedly say around 5,000, but we don't know exactly, and how many, maybe more than 5,000 mosques is destroyed already between 2017 and 2018. And, uh, you know, some foreign journalists and the scholar time to time visit the Turkestan Kashkar Hotel area. They are visit 2015. This exists in the mosque, then 2017, they were there, couldn't find any sign. At the beginning, Chinese government just destroyed this minaret, Islamic minaret, and put the Chinese flag first, to the start 2015-16, then step by step, then 2017 completely destroyed. So, up to two years later, one year later, is a visit, you couldn't find any sign. So, exactly, we don't know exactly, but definitely uh, more than 5,000. So, all the imam, who is the imam of this mosque, is a camp today, is a camp. And the Chinese government in the put more than three million people in the camp. First, the targeting group is religious group. Not only Imam, who in used to went once in the mosque, no in the concentration camp, did they, you know? And who once alive went to Saudi Arabia for Hajj, no in the concentration camp. And who is once visit 26 countries, 
most of the Muslim country, Turkey, Malaysia, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Chinese government already did it. Who visit once 26 countries? They have a list. This person must be targeted. The concentration. And whose house has any relatives in exile? This family is targeting in the, this family in the concentration camp. Yeah. This is so, and uh, uh, actually how many uh, mosques still exist? And uh, uh, how many uh, mosques still uh, destroyed? Really don't know. Be because very difficult to get information today. Because everywhere is surveillance, so you cannot take the pictures, you cannot talk to people, you cannot visit. Uh, even I told you at the beginning, even I have no idea. My ma father is still alive or died. It is a situation. So that's why some question is very difficult to answer at the moment. Yeah. There are no other, no other please. I have uh, one question to Ms. Yang about Falun Gong. How many, you know, Falun Gong sympathizers or activists are outside of China? And where is your biggest base? That's the one question to you. And then to Dokung, I would like to know from you, uh, since uh, the Uyghur problem came to the forefront of the international attention. How did, did it affect uh, Uyghur brothers and sisters in exile? Did it, did it have a very massive mobilization effect? So that one question. Second question is the Muslim countries and government, what is their position on the Uyghur issue? So these two questions. Okay. Uh, to be honest, Falun Gong doesn't really have a base. Because uh, before the persecution, this uh, Chinese regime reported and about 100 million people practice Falun Gong. That's uh, from their figure. And uh, because uh, people, once people, the Falun Gong really have a miracle effect on curing illnesses. Once the people practice it, and their illness come, and even people, some people at the late stage of cancer. So that's why even the persecution lasts for 20 years, and more people practice Falun Gong, started practicing Falun Gong. And also, Falun Gong spread all over the world. It really doesn't have a base where, you know, yeah. First question, well, you know, and the Uyghur issue and the Tibet issue completely same. Both country is occupied by communist China, but Tibet issue is well known everywhere. Everybody know. Uyghur issue is nearly until couple of years nobody knows. But since a couple of years is now is more uh, uh, people know the Uyghur cause. There is a several of reasons, of course. First, we don't have Uyghur community in the Europe and the United States Western country. And uh, until 1990, middle of 1990, only very few our leaders, Arkin Altikin, you are a good friend of Erkin Altikin, he is a good friend of the Holiness Dalai Lama. Erkin Altikin is only the person who doing this job until 19, middle of 1990. Because the Europe, no Uyghur community, no Uyghur organization. Erkin Altikin, who used to work the Radio Liberty, and uh, he used this opportunity and uh, with Tibetan friends together and uh, all the time and uh, uh, trying to uh, raise the Uyghur uh, issue. Then after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, then we had a little bit of opportunity to Uyghur camp uh, from East Turkestan to Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, then slowly, slowly came to Europe. Today is a whole Europe, more, uh, around 10 to 15,000 Uyghurs, more than uh, 15 uh, countries in the Europe, Western Europe and the uh, United States, America. So now we have Uyghur organization. Then 2004, we established World Uyghur Congress. Yeah. Uh, 
end of 1990, beginning of 2000, then there's, there's some European countries, for example, Norway, Sweden, Belgium, established the small, small Uyghur community and established Uyghur organization. Then 2004, and the old Uyghur representative from Central Asia, from North America, and the Turkey, and the whole European countries to delegation coming together, then established World Uyghur Congress. Now is the World Uyghur Congress in the uh, central body of the Uyghur movement in exile. Now uh, we have uh, good mobilized. Of course, we have small problem all, all, uh, sometimes, but it's mostly, and this is uh, under the leadership of the Uyghur Congress, the Uyghur uh, movement is uh, doing well around the world. And the second question for the Muslim country. Well, I told already, today China really start war against Islam. Start war all, all the religious, particularly Islam. So we can, Xi Jinping say Islam is ideological illness, it, it must be eradicated, look. But whole the Muslim world is silence. Islam is not only religious for the Uyghur. Is Islam is religious for one and a half billion people on the world. We are very disappointed because something is happening in some part of the world, immediately whole the Muslim jumping and, and this make a protest. A couple of years ago, one of some caricature was the uh, Denmark newspaper. Was whole the Muslim world stand up, hold the day the demonstration. Two three years ago, one of the pastor in New York, he made announcement. He collected Quran. He want to burn the Quran, but whole the world stand up and protest him. He didn't do it. But 2018, 2017, Chinese government CCP burned the Quran already. Burn the Quran. Close more than 5,000 mosques. No, forbidden fasting. But no single reaction from the Islamic world. Yes, it is. Turkish government last uh, March section of the Council of Foreign Minister Chavi Shoghani made a statement and the U uh, UN. It was good. Malaysia sometimes talk. But later time, just June section, 23 Europe, most European country sent a jointly letter to the High Commissioner and asking close to the concentration camp. But Chinese government mobilized another 50 country, sent a joint letter supporting the Chinese policy towards the Uyghur. Among them, and the 50 countries, 16 is Muslim country. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, all support, not only Silence, even support the Chinese government. It is really shame, and a very disappointing situation. Yeah. Please, yes, Jen. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Chiman, and I'm from Hong Kong. A student uh, currently studying in Geneva. Um, I have two questions to meet, uh, Mr. Westfindy. Uh, the first one is that. Um, how much influence does uh, China have in influencing the global agenda of organ, uh, organ donation? For example, uh, to what extent uh, is China able to shape the organ donation agenda favorable to its interest uh, in IOs such as the World Health Organization? And the second question is, what can the Western liberal uh, democracies do in order to uh, sort of contain the influence of China have in the organ donation uh, agenda in order to prevent China from normalizing uh, its organ harvesting crime. Thank you. Frankly, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I, I, I think the, the, the best information on this um, on this um, topic can get, can be gathered through the China Tribunal that has been mentioned, and from the Coalition to End Organ Transplants, who is back is in the back of, uh, who, who backed the, the, the establishment of the China Tribunal. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but um, because I, I, I published a couple of, uh, of uh, interviews in Bitter Winter, putting to my, um, to the people I interviewed, this, the, the same questions, and they, um, basically they didn't answer. Um, probably we don't have 
so much data available. Um, let me just add, not to, to just just to to shy from the from the question. Let me just add that some of the the people involved with the Chinese Ministry or Secretariat of Health has been invited to Italy and to the Vatican to address the topic. Uh, this means probably that. Many international interlocutors of, on, on this on this topic are not really willing to 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 know the truth about human harvesting. It's, it may be, and I underline may be, uh, to to it, it may be easy for them just to turn the head away. And we have documents, we have testimonies uh, on that uh, shame and we don't see so much law, passing of much legislation in the West uh, dealing directly with that. Uh, they, it is mainly addressed indirectly which means on a cultural level, which is important, but we need to act. Uh, but again, I'm not an expert on that. Maybe our friend can be more precise on that. And the second question was, if I really quick, no, I, I answered both, I guess. More or less? You, you had another question? It is how the Western liberal world can uh, What's that can the uh, Western liberal countries do in order to prevent uh, China from dominating the global agenda of uh, organ donations? So that, like, in order to prevent China from normalizing uh, activities such as uh, organ harvesting in the future. I just have a humble um, suggestion for China. Can we know for sure how many death penalties are carried out every every year? That could be very much interesting. You, um, uh, international Amnesty International, uh, who reports on that, says that we don't know because it's a state secret. So first of all, let let us know how many people are killed every year in in uh, in China. Uh, we would like to read the the the, the, the final judgment why they were killed. Uh, and maybe we could have access to the trials. That, I think, could help a little bit. The question. Yeah, please. Um, uh, from the Chinese culture, to be honest, uh, we don't have this kind of the culture, see, after people die and we donate our, our organs. Uh, is uh, because the Chinese people believe uh, after people die, we like to be like a whole body is uh, complete, is not uh, taking organs away. This is not our culture. And the organ harvesting, really, from the Chinese uh, published death penalty each year, and also these uh, things, uh, 2000, uh, these uh, Chinese, uh, these uh, transplantation, suddenly this uh, number increased. So from this uh, penalty figure until the, the Chinese, uh, this um, uh, minute, one of the minister, and talk to the world about how many these uh, transplantation, liver transplantation, he did for a year. So these are two figures that doesn't match. And then two, uh, David, David Kugel and Mattis from uh, Canada, they started to investigate. And this uh, China tribunal, since uh, they, they interviewed more than 50 uh, witnesses, and they also called China, each of the panel, they called China for 10, 10 or 20 phone calls. Yeah? They called different provinces, and then they pretending they are looking for the organs for their relatives. And then the hospital, and they said, do you have a Falun Gong organs? And they, the hospital said, oh yes, come. Two weeks, we can find the match for you. I think if you go to the China Tribunal website, you will find more details. And all the witnesses, this, uh, uh, the document is there. 
Thank you. Yes, now, uh, this is for the final question. I, uh, we are closed. Uh, yeah, this is the final question, sir. So, sorry, it just wasn't a question, it was a comment on the last question. What, what can be done in Western countries about this issue? Uh, I, in our last Canadian Parliament, I put forward legislation modeled after, after similar legislation which is already passed in Taiwan, Israel, other places, which make it illegal to go abroad to receive an organ without consent, which means that if a Canadian, if this bill is to pass, it means if a Canadian goes abroad and receives an organ that's taken as a result of organ harvesting, that person Person will be prosecuted when they return to Canada. And it's easier to prosecute than other cases of extraterritorial jurisdiction because there's often medical follow-up required. So if you have a robust reporting mechanism, which we tried to include as well, that involves doctors when they see someone who's received, uh, had a transplant that didn't happen in the country, then there can be a mechanism for investigation. This addresses the issue of organ harvesting, but it also helps to confront other cases where organs are extracted, maybe in countries where it is illegal, but where other states aren't able to effectively enforce it. So I would commend that to the consideration of, of others because if we can create some momentum around getting bills like this passed throughout the world that will really shift the discourse around uh, around China and organ tra transplants. I, I have a quick, just a genius. quick question for you. Uh, do we have a similar legislation in Europe? You know, I can't remember offhand if there's any European I countries. Remember. There's, there's, <laughs> I remember. I, I think, think there are six or seven around the world that have adopted it. I know Israel and Taiwan, and I'm not remembering the others off the top of my head. Is it comment? If I can just quickly, we actually tried to pass this in Czech Parliament, but the pro-China lobby blocked it. So that's to your answer whether they're actually pushing and actually influencing this debate or not. I think the urgent, question, uh, urgent action we should take is uh, contact the government, uh, is uh, pass the resolution, stop their, your citizens in your country to go to China to get this uh, organ transplanted. Because uh, that means uh, once you go, there's uh, more than one person died, for, killed for this person's organ. This is an urgent question, I think. Thank you very much. Now we have come to a close. Uh, thank you all for this very lively discussion and I would like to thank our eminent panelists for their well-researched discussion on today's topic, high-tech repression of people of faith in China, and thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, moderator, and all our panelists uh, for the session and for sharing your insights on how China is taking the suppression against people of faith in a whole new level. So thank you so much. And may I request Representative Chimi Rigzingla to kindly present our Tibetan traditional scarf and a amendment to Tibetan Thangka to say thank you very much for all your contribution for making this panel very informative and interesting. Thank you. much. Thank you so much to all the panelists, moderator, and all our participants for your contribution. And so with this, we come to the 
end of the first day of the 2019 Geneva Forum on China's high-tech repression and freedom of religion. So thank you so much. And uh, so we had a very long day. Uh, we have a coffee, uh, it's a networking coffee. Those who have more questions and would like to interact with our panelists and also within the participant, all are welcome. And thank you so much. And we will see you tomorrow at 9.30 again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.